Hi and welcome back to a new video. As you can see, I have my friend's AMD 486 wafer and random 300 milliliter wafer next to me, which means that we're going to do some nanotechnology content again in today's video. We were visiting Kleindeek in the first part of this episode, and it's a company which is specialized on nanoprobing. If you don't know what that is, you should probably check out the first video, otherwise you will probably not understand what we are talking about today. I also asked you to Think about if you have any kind of questions which you want to know or if I missed something in the first video. And then we had a guy called Guxi and he asked, why do we even have this technology? Like, what is it useful for? And for a certain degree, you can do reverse engineering with this. So in detail, Intel could use this technology to acquire some TSMC samples, transistors, and just check what are the characteristics of their transistors, compare it with their own work, and perform some kind of reverse engineering. At the same time, it's also for quality check. And that's what we're going to do in today's video, because we are going to look at one example from TSMC, where you're using this technology. Van86 asked, what kind of magnitudes are we seeing in those screen captures? And depending on the current state or what we're even looking at, if the needles are making contact with the transistors, if we are on a transistor level, typically the magnitude of the scanning electron microscope is somewhere between 50,000 and 150,000 times. You can always see that if you look at those screen captures, typically on the bottom left or either bottom right, you can see something called mag or magnitude and there you can see the current magnification. Sonic, the heart of your system. Now we were in the situation where the needles were making contact on a nano scale with the transistors and the first step is that we actually have to find out what kind of transistors are we looking at, what kind of transistors do we want to measure. Are those N-doped or P-doped transistors? Once we're making contact with the surface, we want to find out if it's NMOS or PMOS transistors and what kind of contact we're even hitting with the needle, so if it's source, drain or gate. Using the tool on the right side, we can now apply a voltage to one of the needles or multiple of the needles. If we're just using a single needle, we're just running the voltage across the substrate, so the silicon. Or if we're using multiple needles, we can actually also make up a circuit. We're starting off with a single needle and checking if we can find any kind of diet characteristics. In that case, it would be either source or train of the transistor. And if we cannot get any kind of characteristics, it's either the gate or we didn't have proper contact. In our case, the needles seven and five are making contact on the left side and we can also get clear characteristics, which means that we have a PMOS transistor in our case. Needle number three for some reason didn't have proper contact and needed repositioning. In the next step, we're using the transistor test tool on the right side and first we have to define that gate is needle number three, source is needle number seven and drain is needle number five. We're now testing with a voltage from zero to minus one volt. On the right side, you can see the colored curves assigned to the gate voltage. Looking at the black curve with minus 0.2 volt and the dark red curve with minus 0.4 volt, we cannot get any activity yet. However, looking at the bright red curve, starting at a certain gate voltage, the transistor will start working and we're now looking at drain drain source current over drain source voltage. If we now want to investigate all those parameters even more in detail, we're using something which is called Keithley 4200A. And that is the big box which is sitting on top right here with the display in front. And that's a very accurate measurement device, also very expensive, which you can equip with additional expansion cards for even more accurate measurements. In our case, we are trying to find out at what exact gate voltage the transistor will switch. And in the advanced probing tool software from Kleindeek, we can now adjust all those different parameters like setting drain source gate voltage and the related currents in microamps. And again, also in this measurement, we can get a gate voltage of about 0.4 volt, which is required to get a decent source drain current. Thank you. 
Using all those different measurement devices and tools, you can, for example, compare your transistor to another company's transistor, for example. Kleindig is also specialized using eBeak and eBeck, which is electron beam induced current. Basically, you have your electron beam running across the surface of your like wafer or your chip, whatever. And this way you're inducing a current to the substrate. And then if you apply the needle to a certain point, you can see which of those parts are connected to each other. Like if there's a connected circuit. In this test, we're using only a single needle because we want to attach the needle to a certain point and then see which of the other parts around it are connected to that individual point. But first of all, we have to switch the detector from secondary electrons to EBIC. And then you can already see on the left side how the image changes. And you can already get an impression on the darker areas which parts are connected. Now we can also adjust the visuals. I mean, that's not how it looks in reality, but we're using imaging software to make those parts more visible. Now looking at the red areas, those are the areas with the current close to zero and the blue areas are with the highest current. For these kinds of tests, we're also using very tiny currents. In our case, it was 250 picoamps, which makes it a non-destructive test method because those kind of currents will not damage the transistors or those circuits. But what would be a real use case for this technology? And we're using an example again from TSMC. Right here, you can see again a 7 nanometer TSMC chip. Well, in detail, you can see TSMC 7 nanometer traces. And we want to find out which of those traces are connected, which is something you cannot see with a normal scanning electron microscope. You can see the individual traces of the 7 nanometer CPU, but you will not see which of those are connected. Kleindig had another example where they're using this technology and for example in this case they had a short circuit within a transistor and using EBIC you can see this tiny red spot and that's where you have a short circuit within transistors. Using this information you can go back to your manufacturer and then adjust accordingly. The last thing Kleindig wanted to showcase is probing an SRAM cell. Actually they wanted to show that it's not that easy to probe an SRAM cell. SRAM cells are for example the places like level 1 cache where you're storing the information of a CPU and an SRAM cell typically contains six transistors and they're making those L shapes where it's pretty easy to spot them. Now the big issue with those SRAM cells is that for example with TSMC 7 nanometer they're using cobalt and cobalt easily forms an oxide layer once it's exposed to the ambient air. So if you're preparing those chips grinding down, etching, whatever. If you leave it in the ambient room for, I don't know, like a day, it will easily form a cobalt oxide layer. And this is insulating. And that way you're not making contact with the needles anymore, which makes probing of SRAM cells really difficult. Comparing different processes, for example, the TSMC 7 nanometer versus the Intel 10 nanometer, you're also often looking at the SRAM cell size. For example, TSMC 7 nanometer with 54 times 40 nanometer and Intel's 10 nanometer with 54 times 44 nanometer. And this way you maybe got an impression now what this SRAM cell looks like. To sum it up, this entire nanoprobing process stuff is used either in reverse engineering, for example, if Intel wants to look at TSMC transistors, or if you have an issue in production, for example, like you could see with the short circuit inside the single transistor, then you could use EBIC, check if there is like a tiny short circuit somewhere and then adjust your manufacturing process accordingly. But to me personally, it was absolutely impressive just to see that it's even possible to just test a single transistor like on a mechanical level, on a nanometer scale. It was very, very impressive. And I hope you also enjoyed this second part and uh, sorry that it took so long to release the second part, but thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye-bye.